joining me today are Professor Al Valentis, um, Professor of Film Studies here at uh, RAC, and Dr. Christopher Weedman. You're a professor of English, and do you teach film studies as well? I teach film studies at Kutztown University. Kutztown University. So can I get a little like CV from you guys uh, as to? Yeah, uh, who you sure. Are? I'm, I'm not a doctor of horror. I'm actually a recovering journalist. I okay. spent most of my career uh, at the Reading Eagle. And I did review and uh, write about film for more than 20 years. Um, during the 1980s, we did a companion film review show for a local cable channel that I co-starred in and uh, produced. And for the past six years, I've been teaching at RAC in the Communications Humanities Department and teaching film studies currently and next semester. And thank you for having me, Josh. Yeah, thank you for joining me. Uh, I teach at Kutztown University. I got my PhD at Southern Illinois University in English, but I concentrated in film studies there and have written about various type of film over the years. I did my dissertation on the films of a British filmmaker uh, named uh, Joseph Losey. Actually, he's an American filmmaker, but moved to Britain back in the late 1950s. But then I've written about all types of films and filmmakers, people ranging from, you know, horror filmmakers like Roman Polanski to, you know, I've taught classes on the films of Hitchcock and others. Um, how do you define horror as a genre of film, uh, and what do you think makes it distinct? I would usually say that horror usually taps into some sort of basic fear that, you know, most people can identify with, you know, things like, you know, the fear of the dark, the fear of the unknown, and so forth. But at the same time, usually transgresses some sort of boundary. You know, I think films that you know go past a certain level, like for example, I think one that comes to mind is from the 1970s, uh, Wes Craven's movie, The Last House on the Left. Mm -hmm. If you look at that the plot line of that movie, which you know he took from Ingmar Bergman's movie, um, The Virgin Spring, that you know, gang, you know, rapes two women out in the woods, kidnaps them, and so forth sounds like it could just be a suspense thriller, but it's so disturbing in the way the film's put together and it really goes past the level of decency in so many ways, then in my mind it becomes a horror film. So while I don't always think that horror films have to do with the occult or something supernatural right. or the grotesque, but I think if it goes past a certain boundary of taste in that direction, I think it... it I tend to agree the most effective horror uh, taps into a primal fear. Uh, and it could also be visceral, Alien, for instance, which is on the surface about a monster loose on a spaceship. Very standard plot, people trapped, uh, something's there, how to get them. But it's also about uh, violation, uh, male rape on another level. Uh, but for a definition of horror, I'd look uh, back to what Robert Bloch, the author of Psycho, once said. And uh, his definition was that a clown is funny in the circus. But imagine opening the door at night and seeing the same clown standing there in the moonlight. And he called it the clown at midnight, which actually turns out uh, Lon Chaney, the great horror <laughs> actor, may have been the one to originate that. Uh, too much horror, on the other hand, relies upon the quick scare. That it's easy to scare somebody, jump out at them. Uh, we do it to each other all the time. Yeah, we jump. Uh, but what did it mean afterwards? As, as opposed to generating terror, we're sort of generating startles. And I think anyone can be startled. I mean, exactly. It doesn't really matter. It, does, it doesn't tap into any part of your psyche or anything like that. Uh, yeah, and looking, at, uh, looking back at Alien again, I happened, it's an old movie, uh, ages me, I've seen it on, uh, first saw it on opening night, where everything was a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, now the, the famous chest bursting scene has been uh, imitated. Uh, any horror fan may have heard about it before you see the movie again. But yeah, when I first saw it, it was so unexpected, but yet at the same time so logical that what was happening made sense. And, and horror movies have to follow their own internal logic. Yeah, a lot of it you know, might seem stupid afterward. It follows, for instance. Big hit this year, some would say, well, what is this thing that's following them? Can't you get on a plane and fly to New Zealand? <laughs> right, right. But yes, while it's going on, it makes sense on a certain level, in addition to being just an extremely well-crafted horror film. 
and some things like you said with those jump scenes that you have in Alien which are so effective that those things work at a particular time when audiences are not expected them where then now those things have become a convention people are used to them you see a long silence you see maybe a really close-up shot um, you're starting to right. anticipate what is going to be a pretty obvious jump scare looking out the window maybe um, at something we don't know is off screen is sort of a primer now you're kind of already primed for that scare. Well, I remember there was an interview that John Carpenter gave one time where when Halloween came out in 1978, he said that just even a few years later, by 1981, when he made Halloween 2, mm -hmm. it had to be so gory because audiences expected it by that time because the Friday the 13th films had come out, Scanners by David Cronenberg had come out, which has a you know, head-bursting scene that's very much unexpected, like what yeah. you're talking about with Alien. So by that time, audiences, you had to have the graphic gore, and you couldn't do something in the kind of subtle suspense, almost Hitchcockian way that Carpenter was doing it with the original. So there is only like two or three years, and that shows just how, just in a short amount of time, audiences' tastes change. What's your favorite horror movie? Like, if you had to pick one, well, I mean, there, there are so many. I would mm -hmm. probably say, because it seems like my tastes have changed as I've you know, gotten older for whatever reason. Like when I was younger, all those kind of very visceral graphic horror films were you know, particularly thrilling. But now, just watching it again recently, watching Polanski's Rosemary's Baby, a movie that really has very little graphic violence in it at all, but it's so unsettling because it starts off like a Doris Day movie. Everything looks like it's so picturesque, New York upper class apartment. But then at the same time, there's something just off there. And then the way the movie builds its terror by the fact that you don't know whether she's actually, the, this coven of witches is actually after her baby right. or whether it's just in her mind that because of her fears of becoming a mother that she's imagined all of this. So that very kind of subtle psychological works for me a little bit better than it did even 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I probably would have said something like I don't know, scanners or videodrome or something along those lines. That's funny you picked Rosemary's Baby. I actually have written here. That was going to be my pick as well. So um, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> you're nestling in on my territory here. But um, yeah, definitely one thing I liked about Rosemary's Baby is um, it's the familiarity of all the horror. It's it's her family, her her um, I think newlywed husband and um, her baby to come. Everything and the neighbors, of course, are off, and so everything sort of comes to that level that's very close, uh, and we can all kind of relate to maybe having a bit of social paranoia, but it's sort of taken to the extreme where she doesn't she doesn't. She's not able to trust um, John Cassavetes' character, whose name I can't remember. But Plansky's always like the perfect one, especially the perfect director for shooting movies in confined spaces. So yeah. things like Repulsion and The Tenant all taking place in apartments. Because I don't know, having lived in many apartments over the years, there's something just something claustrophobic about apartments. So I think in that way he taps into that, plus in all the familial things that you're talking about. And he about. taps into the weirdness too, because you're kind of like in Manhattan, you're on top of people, you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And they could be downright weird. And um, obviously, um, Rosemary ends up being right on about that, that the, her neighbors are bizarre. Um, but that's sort of a fear that well, I What makes Rosemary's Baby a little bit unusual is it is based on a book that was a bestseller mm -hmm. and attracted uh, essentially for the time a very A-list, certainly director and uh, cast, very similar to Hitchcock's Psycho, which was based on a novel that I actually happened to have read before seeing the movie dating even further. But um, Hitchcock tried to buy up all copies of the book once he wanted to make the movie. Let's get it out of print, something of course we can't do uh, these days, but it would have spoiled the surprise. Yeah, there's something I think about even both of those uh, books, you know, being made in the films, which I think were much different in the 60s where a lot of, uh, of the great horror films were really coming from, you know, major studios, and then by the time that you get to the 70s, outside of the big success of The Exorcist and The Omen, 
then you really get that kind of more grindhouse, very low budget, independent horror, which I really think really kind of made a mark. You know, everything from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to Halloween. Which is really the point probably it started. Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 74 mm -hmm. went into Halloween, which went into David Cronenberg, and then of course all of the 80s were the Teenager in Peril mm -hmm. films, uh, Friday the 13th, of course. Uh, right here on the street. So right, yes. Yes. It, there was like so much of a glut of them that came out in the 80s, it's almost impossible to, uh, to keep track of all of them because I think it set up a really easy formula that you got unknown actors in a very small and maybe even rural environment. You could do it on a low budget and if you were successful like Carpenter and make a movie for 300000 make $50 million, you could become a star overnight where I think by the time we get to the 90s, then I think it goes into that like that Tarantino generation of making different types of movies. Talking about favorites, which is like, what's your, who's your favorite child? I don't have any children, so I don't have a favorite child. But uh, for favorite horror movie, one I, I'd like to talk about that's probably fairly uh, unseen in these days is from 1963, The Haunting, uh, the original one by Robert Wise, which was remade into a a fairly typical uh, new millennium remake with a lot of uh, big effects, but in the original one, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, everything is suggested, and it has the one absolutely terrifying scene of the two women at night, and the one uh, is holding the other's hand, and she says, I'm not holding your hand. <laughs> so that fear of the dark, uh, what is there, that you never see it, and the suggestion is, are these ghosts real, or is this all part of, you know, an unhinged, unhinged sight? Uh, what do you think are some underrated horror films that maybe more people need to appreciate? A lot of horror fans love the genre so much that they'll, they'll dig into every nook and cranny to try to find them. So even when I was thinking about the question, you know, what, what's an underrated one to be, I guess one of the first things that come to mind is thinking of uh, The Changeling, a movie from 1979 with George C. Scott, where, like The Haunting, another ghost, uh, ghost story movie, but one where you have a widower who's lost not only his wife and his child, but there's just some unnerving scenes in that movie, particularly one where a, a red ball that his daughter was her favorite, her favorite toy that he's kept as his only memento of her. He ends up finding it rolls down the steps, and he realizing this house is haunted, he takes this ball, drives off, throws it off a bridge comes home and the same ball starts bouncing down the steps again. And then plus you have such a major actor like George C. Scott playing the role that to me it's just one of those really little small Canadian films that really deserves a better audience than maybe what it's gotten over the years. Yeah, that was actually my pick and well was the changeling. Sometimes you have to be careful with the big name actors because mm -hmm. they could be in it for the money. And we have John Cassavetes and Rosemary's Baby but yet he was also in Incubus. And he said, I'm in the movie because I make my own movies and this pays the bills. Right. And John Sayles uh, will write Alligator and then he can make Return of the Sarcophagus 7. But he had, he had so many uh, great actors, especially ones that came out of the classic Hollywood era or from the 50s and the 60s. It became really popular to cast really big name actors in small roles and it always at the time a lot of those actors got criticized like they were doing these films just for the money or they were you know their career was at an end so they could only do horror films but at the same time some of them would give some really interesting performances in some really kind of small you know um, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive which first blush may not seem like a total horror film. But yet, in looking back, there's one scene behind the dumpster that some say is one of the scariest jump scares. And the whole movie uh, follows this whole uh, structure of a nightmare that when it's all over, you're never quite sure what's happening, and nothing can make literal sense on it. 
Uh, it's really his last film, it's a decade old, but his last real film other than Inland Empire, which was sort of a vanity project for uh, DVD. Yeah, and it's funny because Lynch is one of those figures that his, his movies are so strange. In many ways, even stranger than Polanski, who you know, always had that oddness too. But at the same time, it's like you have somebody like Mulholland Drive, a movie like Mulholland Drive, that starts off more like a noir, but then it goes past the level. So that's why I said at the beginning of our conversation, when you have films where they seem to go past a certain level of either decency or weirdness or whatever, then you can easily kind of walk into a completely different genre. And he remains completely inscrutable about what these films mean. Uh, like Eraser here, how did he do the baby? Uh, he, he's asked things and he'll either say, no, you're wrong, or not to comment on it. It's really all for the audience to decide, whereas other filmmakers will state their intentions uh, and have a discussion on it. But if you ask Lynch about any of these, it's, well, it's the audience. It's like a work of art that you look at a painting and you don't expect the painter to explain everything. Right. It's much brushstroke of what it means. What I love about the diner scene in Mulholland Drive um, is that he plays with your anticipation of is he going to pull this jump scare? I mean, you haven't really established whether this movie is supernatural or what's going on here. And so when you see the character, I mean, if you actually like look at the character up close and you spend a long time on it, he's kind of goofy looking. Yeah. He's kind of a funny looking character, but it's so intensely bizarre and, and, and it scares well, you. Lynch really resents uh, how DVDs allow audiences to rewind and go back right, and right. do this to the point where his one straight movie, The Straight Story, uh, where he wanted to prove I could make a G-rated film for Disney, which I think is quite fine. For the DVD, he insisted there are no chapter stops, there's nothing. If you want to scan through it, but I'm not going to make it easy for you. And there's other filmmakers the same way with like Woody Allen will never do a audio commentary because he thinks the film should speak for themselves. So I agree with Lynch in that way. That sometimes it's better just to let the film stand on its own merits and let the audiences and the critics and so forth figure out what the meaning was because that's what the audiences and critics have done for years anyway. Interestingly, um, Penn Jillette, the magician, is friends with John McNaughton, said that. Henry only had, I guess he wore like a brown suede jacket or something, and they discovered when they were filming that this is the only jacket, and if you know in film production, if you have a prop or piece of costuming in your room, you have a continuity problem. So he had to do weird stuff as to when he wore it and didn't wear it because if it got splashed with the blood, you may be out of luck. Uh, so <laughs> it had to chainsaw massacre, Leatherface's outfit, was one of a kind, so it might be 110 degrees in August, but you're not going to wash it and right. not let it shrink. But I think even that's kind of the fun part of even watching those, especially those low budget movies from the 70s, and the fact that you will see little errors in continuity, but at the same time, if you realize the kind of spirit that went into making them, whether it's Texas Chainsaw or Halloween or so forth, you kind of end up forgiving it in a way because those movies were done with so much uh, devotion. Everybody committed to the project. Because in my mind, any successful movie is like a miracle that even got pulled off anyway, because a movie can go wrong, even a high budget movie. How about up and coming directors? Is there anyone in particular that you think you're looking at now and you're saying um, maybe they've done a few horror films and they could branch out, or maybe um, you think they would be good for horror? Well, whoever did it follows, and I guess up and coming because I don't remember the director's name. I think that was uh, a standout uh, film, not just for talking about the, the narrative, but the way it was shot with, with, the, with the deep focus photography and the yeah, white screen, great. with the idea that you know something is following, and now uh, he's forcing you to watch the whole frame. Directors can direct the audience that this is what's important. And I thought that was a very subtle point in the film that audiences may not get of how they're responding to it. I have a really offbeat choice. Okay. Because they have nothing to, nothing to do with the horror film. Mm -hmm. But I think they have qualities and the types of programs they do that I think they, they can do it if they put their energy in that direction. 
and it's actually uh, the writer, producer, Matthew Weiner from Mad Men, only because Mad Men is a show where it has such an attention to detail, to visual look, mm -hmm. and production design, it doesn't mind getting into really dark psychology of characters. And I think in something like horror, particularly in you know, those, everything we talked about, like Rosemary's Baby, Texas Chainsaw, there's such an attention to detail, even in the sets and so forth. I always think of that one set in Texas Chainsaw where Marilyn, I think it's Marilyn Burns, no, not Marilyn Burns, the one before her who first enters the house and then ends up like falling into the, to the room full of bones and so forth. There's such an attention to the set of that, of that scene that really unnerves you to no level, even to the point where you have that odd chicken that's in the, the bird bird cage that's hanging there. That I think sometimes filmmakers maybe going for the big scare or something sensational really don't have that kind of really fine attention to that subtle detail that I think he does. At the same time, I don't really picture that happening, but at the same time I think it would be effective. Uh, what tropes or devices do you think are maybe overused now? What would you want to see go, or what would you maybe like if you were to say a return to form, what would that look like? Getting rid of um, everything being digital and uh, computer. The audiences seem to have, want to have things thrown at them, and, that, and these are the same franchises, the same types of movies. Now, I did not catch uh, Guillermo del Toro's new film, I think you said you had, Josh. Yeah, yeah. But I have read that um, some say it's being marketed terribly, that it's not meant to be a scary movie like the others, that right. it has more of the, the classical, and I mean classical Emily, Emily Bronte, you know, type feel to it. Definitely. Um, you know, some of the things, uh, the tropes that we've talked about, I and mean, going back to where we even started, in Alien, there is no good reason for a cat to be on that spaceship, other than I think there's a nudge by the filmmakers. <laughs> You're getting at the unexpected, but we're also, if we have a cat here, it's going to jump. The Nostromo as a spaceship yeah. is terrible. <laughs> it's dark, nobody can see anything. It's always it's leaking. Red. Yeah, I'm not I leaking. I understand uh, how effective that is. Many might disagree with me, but one that I'm getting kind of tired of, and it's more of a newer trope is the, the post-Scream series of films with self-referential -re irony. The mm -hmm. postmodern where all the characters know all the conventions and the movies are all tongue-in-cheek. I just find that while when Scream originally came out, when I saw it in the theater, being a teenager at the time, I thought it was very effective because you had seen so many of those slasher movies that just it was fun to watch a film where they're commenting on that. But then you know, lately when I'm watching things like you know, Cabin in the Woods and so forth, there's a movie I just didn't find particularly effective either as a horror movie or as a comedy. And it's just something that I'm kind of getting a little bit tired of. Because to me, when you go back to those horror movies that were sent personal to the 70s movies, that you felt like they were real characters in real situations. And I think in most instances, the characters in horror films shouldn't sound like they're MFA students from college, you know, that, that talk in a very kind of hip way. I think in most instances, people are just normal people. And sometimes I think the characters in those type of movies are a little bit too hip and savvy for the movie's success. Yeah, they, they can be either too stupid to the point where they don't make any logical decisions whatsoever. Um, and then you're like, you're at, at that, that is a trope, you can easily leave characters to their demise, but it doesn't really feel like you earned it when they've made such terrible decisions. And then, like you said, where the characters are too self-aware and the movies maybe are hanging the lampshade on everything and kind of pointing at. Um, I, I often say that, you know, you can self-consciously sort of point out, oh, I'm making this dumb joke, but you're still making that dumb joke. Mm -hmm. Like, if you still make the dumb joke, then um, commit to it. Like, you can't, you're hedging your bets a little bit. And sometimes, they're, and sometimes the movies are condescending, I think, too, Yeah. Because of the fact that what they're saying is all these movies that came out before, those were so stupid, right. and they're so cliched, 
I can do so much better of a job. I'm going to show you how dumb they are by showing all the conventions. But at the same time, what they all amount to in the end is just them poking fun or saying, aha, look, look how dumb you were to buy into that. Right. And I just, after seeing it a few times where it's done successfully, I just think it's a little bit tired today. I don't think the Scream franchise is one that really wore out as well as much. I thought Scream 2 was better than Scream 1. Of course, we'll miss Wes Craven. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not in any way saying we should continue any further. Uh, but looking at The Nightmare on Elm Street, among all those films, I think going back to underrated, it was Craven's new nightmare. Uh, you're familiar with that, Josh. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. uh, he was asked, let's do another Freddy movie, and well, he's been killed, <laughs> I guess, six or seven times. So they made a self-referential film that they're doing, the, they're, they're discontinuing the franchise, I guess, and now that brings uh, Freddy back. Yeah, I like that. I like that one better. I mean, it, it's actually for its time was doing something different. Yeah. But I think once you've seen it, it's like when you got the when you got the yeah, screen right. and you'd seen the entire teenage slasher cycle, you wanted something different. And now we're tired of what was different before and doing yeah. something. So it comes down on screen one, two, or uh, after screen. One? I, I like I I've shown screen to my students before as a way of like postmodern horror. Okay. And I think in that one. I, I still think it's a good movie, but I think the movies that came out in its way, I think, are. All right, well, thank you, thank you for thank you. coming on. I really appreciate it. I think we had a really good discussion. Hope so.